Well, didn't they do a good job this morning? I'll tell you what. I'm sure Will's out there watching online, live, the live stream, and he ought to be proud of this worship team. Amen? And they made us proud over in, in, uh, at, at Knott's Berry this morning as well as we uh, were able to worship out there with many of the other Christians here in Orange County. And, uh, and then today, it's just always good to be here at Huntington Beach Church on Easter Sunday morning. It's a special day, and, and I can look around the room and tell that it's special for you. I see some of you here that, and have your family here. It's one of those Sundays that's just special to get family together, and, uh, and our families are all centered around this truth that we believe. We believe it so much that it has absolutely defined our worldview, defined who we are as a people. Not only what we're doing right now, but what we believe we'll be doing for the rest of eternity. That's why it matters, and that's why we're here today to celebrate. Amen? Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, in a moment we'll be turning uh, to the book of Romans and some other things, and I'm going to put some stuff up on the screen for you if you just want to follow along along with me. But uh, the, it's interesting. The other day I was hanging out with some of the men in our church, and I asked them a question. I said, hey, do you, do you know who Rufus is? Do you know who Ru any of you, anybody in here know, know Rufus? Do you know Rufus? And that, that's kind of the look there. It's just the look that I just got from some of you, like, Rufus? Who is Rufus? And so we were talking about it, who this guy Rufus is, and uh, we were talking about that he's someone in the Bible that uh, is, is, has an amazing story. In fact, we, uh, we turned over to Romans chapter 16 and verse 13, where Paul was writing this letter to the uh, Romans church, a uh, church in Rome, and he said, greet who? You can say it. Rufus. Don't you love that name? Greet Rufus, whom the Lord picked out to be his very own. Boy, now that's good. Whom the Lord picked out to be his very own. And also his dear mother, who has been a mother to me. Now, isn't that interesting? Did you know that Paul had a person in his life, a lady, whom he got so close to, this person took care of him so much, loved Paul so much, that he became like his adopted mother? Who was this woman? It was the mother of Rufus. Come on, Rufus. Y'all know Rufus, right? Y'all are still looking at me. Who in the world is Rufus. I mean, you can see this guy, he must be somebody. His mother is, is, is such a wonderful person that the Apostle Paul just says, hey, greet my friend Rufus and his mother. Didn't even have to say her name. Everybody knew her. She's like a mother to me. Well, the question, the answer to this question of who is Rufus leads us into the one of the most amazing untold stories of Easter, an untold story of Easter. You've heard you've, a lot of Christmas sermons, I'm sure, and the Christmas story. You've heard about the thieves on the cross and the, the Roman soldiers and centurions and, and all that went on with, with uh, Pontius Pilate and all the rest. But I'm going to tell you a story today that many of you may not be aware of. Now, to set it up, I need to make sure that all of you are aware, of course, of the most important part of the story, and that is Jesus Christ. The story of Easter is all about Jesus. He's the hero. Who is Jesus? Jesus is actually God. He is God. That's what we believe. Jesus is the creator God. When you go back to Genesis 1-1 and it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, we believe that's referring to Jesus Christ. He is the Word. In fact, the book, the book of John says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was what? God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Bible makes it clear that Jesus is the Word of God that was spoken in Genesis 1-1, that spoke the worlds into the existence. And that Word, the Word of God, is Jesus Christ. He came to this earth. We celebrate his birth at Christmas, all right? 
Every year, the whole world focuses on the birth of Jesus Christ. Whether or not uh, he was actually born on December 25th is, is just beside the point. It's the day that we've chosen to celebrate the fact that God came to this earth and became a human. He became one of us because he loves us so much that he literally came to this earth to solve our problem. He became a human being so that he could live a sinless life, a life of perfect obedience, the life we should live and don't live. Jesus came and lived that life so that he could give us credit for it if we will trust in him. But even more so, he came to die on the cross. And that's the story of Easter. What happened was, is Jesus eventually got to Jerusalem, and there he was arrested and brought before the trial, and, and he was put on trial. He was innocent and never committed any sin. He, again, remember, he's God. He's perfect. His life has been nothing but perfect obedience. And yet, we humans put him on trial. We rejected him. We didn't like him. We never have liked God. That goes all the way back to the garden with Adam and Eve. We've always wanted to be God. Amen? We've always wanted to make our own rules. So we weren't impressed by the fact that Jesus kept God's rules because we don't even respect God's rules. We wanted him to live by our rules, and he did not. So we called him a blasphemer, and we put him on trial, and we found him guilty. We humans cried out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And the Roman soldiers took Jesus. They had beat him. They had whipped him. You may have seen uh, the movies that have been made about that to depict what happened. A brutal, torturous beating that they gave to Jesus. But eventually, they put this large wooden cross on his shoulders. And they had him carry that cross. He basically drug it down the streets of Jerusalem. Down one particular street we call the Via Della Rosa. It went outside the city to a hill called Golgotha. And that's where he would be crucified. But I want to pick up the story right there. I want you to picture Jesus walking down that cobblestone road, the Via Della Rosa. He was walking down that road. Now, he's been beaten. He's been tortured. He's, been, he's, he's, he's had a crown of thorns put on his head. He's, he's been bleeding out for, for hours and hours. And in the middle of all that pain and all of that weakness, they put this heavy cross on his shoulders, and he's walking down that street. It happens to be the time of the Passover in Jerusalem, so there are literally just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that are lining the streets in Jerusalem, all crowding toward the temple, bringing their little lambs and their sacrifices as good Jewish people would do at that time of the year to make their sacrifices in the temple. Why did they make sacrifices? It's because it goes all the way back to the teaching of the Old Testament. They were waiting for the Messiah to come, the Savior that God promised would come. It made a promise all the way back in, in the book of Genesis to Adam and Eve that there would be one born of the woman who would crush the head of Satan and defeat our sin and the, call, and the curse and, 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 and death. And that one was Jesus Christ, and they didn't even know it. He was right there on the streets that day. Again, picturing walking down that street with the cross on his shoulder. He's in pain. He's suffering. They're walking down the street, and the soldiers are trying to hurry them. Because when sun, the sun goes down, we're, we're going to have a problem at the end of that day, because the next day is going to be the Sabbath. And for the Jewish people, that's, that started at sundown. And they didn't want to have any crucifixions going on on the Sabbath. So they needed Jesus to hurry up down the street so we can get him crucified by the end of the day. But he's walking down the street, and he's just going too slow for everybody. So the Bible says... That the Roman soldiers look over into the crowd, and there was a man standing there. His name was Simon the Cyrene. Simon from Cyrene. Where's Cyrene? It's Africa. 
There's a man there all the way from Africa. He had come all the way to Jerusalem because apparently he's a practicing Jew. He had come there to make his sacrifices. And they, the Bible says they reached into the crowd and they forced this man, Simon, to get at the foot of the cross and to pick it up and to carry it. You see, that thing has just been it's just been dragging along on the cobblestones. It's been holding Jesus back, apparently. It's been weighing him down. So they get Simon to pick it up. So now picture Jesus is on the front of the cross with it across his shoulder, and he's walking, and way back at the foot of the cross, there's this man, this black man, this African man, carrying the back end of the cross, helping Jesus walk. This man, Simon, we get to know a lot about him. As we studied his life, you can study it in church history. It's an amazing story. Here's a man plucked out of the crowd. <laughs> he had come to Jerusalem to worship God and to await for the Savior. And he literally gets plucked out of a crowd to carry the Savior's cross. Now, that's quite a story. He gets to be on the, he gets a front row to the whole event that takes place that we're celebrating today. Simon apparently would have walked all the way to, to Mount Calvary. He, he got to see the soldiers as they laid Jesus down and nailed the nails in his hands and his feet and lift him up on the cross. He got to see how Jesus interacted with the crowd and interacted with the other people that were hanging on the crosses next to him. He got to see Jesus die. He got to see as they took Jesus down from the cross. You had to just imagine, here's a man, he had, he had journeyed all this way, almost like a family vacation. I mean, they were, it was probably the highlight of their life. They'd probably been saving for years, and they get pulled in to this event. Now look, looking back on it, it's kind of cool for us to look at it and think, man, that is neat. But if you'd have been there that day, I'm not so sure it would have been such a neat story. I, I don't think Simon was taking selfies back there, you know, while he's holding the cross. This was an execution. He didn't know who this guy was, Jesus the Nazarene. All he had probably heard was that he was a blasphemer. Something was wrong with him. I mean, I can imagine as he was holding that cross and walking down the street, the people were spitting on Jesus and hurling all types of uh, curse words and, and, and terrible things at him, and he's watching all of this. Now, just imagine if that was you. Could you imagine today just all of a sudden being picked up on the street, thrown into a van? driven to some building somewhere, when all of a sudden they, they get you out of the van and take you in the building, you, you realize that you're, in the, you're in the middle of an execution going on. There's a guy strapped to an electric chair, and they're going to have you strap him down and maybe pull the left. Oh, could you imagine what that would be like? Well, that's what it was like for this guy, Simon. He was pulled right into the middle of this thing, which probably caused him to want to just make sure and that he finds out what's going on with all of this. I mean, if i got to be part of it, I want to know what I'm doing and why. So he hung around, and he saw the whole thing take place. The stuff that we're asking you to believe in now, 2,000 years later, this guy Simon got to see it. Just an innocent bystander who had no agenda, no biases, he got to see it. He saw Jesus die. He saw Jesus buried. He saw the Roman soldiers guarding the tomb. And we believe that he was there in that crowd of disciples who got to see Jesus resurrected. And he came to believe in Jesus Christ for who he really is, God and Savior. You say, how do we know that? How do we know he believed? Well, because the Bible talks a lot about what happened in Cyrene. 
Remember his hometown. In fact, I've got a map for you so that you can see what Cyrene looks like. In fact, here's what the Bible says. This passenger from Cy- this, this passerby named Simon from Cyrene, he was just coming in from the countryside. The soldiers grabbed him and forced him to carry the cross. And I want you to look at this map. This is where Cyrene, Africa is. You see it way over here. I've got I tried to do my best. How many of you like maps? Raise your hand. All right. So you can see I put a world map down here at the bottom so you can see where we're at. North Africa is where Cyrene is. Then you can see a little bit over to the right where Mount Calvary in Jerusalem in Israel is. You see that? This is where he came from and where he went. And we find that in, in church history, and it's even mentioned and alluded to in the Bible, that this guy Simon went back to Cyrene and he told everybody what he saw. Could you imagine that story? How he talked about being the one to help this man Jesus carry the cross. He talked about how he saw him die, how he saw him buried, how he saw him rose again. And the Bible says, it alludes to the fact that there was this great outbreak of faith and Christianity in Cyrene. In fact, it goes on to say this, and I'm going to just show you in the book of Acts. Talking about Antioch. See this? Let me go back to the map. You see north of Calvary, that little that town of Antioch? Notice how far away from Africa it is in Cyrene. But the Bible says that in Antioch, there were believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and where? Cyrene. And began preaching to the Gentiles the Lord Jesus. Later it says in Acts 13, among the prophets and the teachers in the church of Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. Now that's an interesting group. Here's a guy all the way from Cyrene. Here's a companion of, of a childhood friend of King Herod. I mean, this is some interesting people that have been put together. And a man named Saul. Who is Saul? Anybody? Paul. We'd eventually call him the Apostle Paul. Right here in this list, he's just Saul. He's just a member of the church. All right, let me go back to my map. So here, this Simon of Cyrene, who had taken his family over to Jerusalem, he got to be an eyewitness of of what happened when Jesus was crucified and rose again, he goes back to his hometown. He begins to share the gospel. People are getting saved. So many are getting saved, and there's such an outbreak of Christianity that eventually they send missionaries all the way up to Antioch, which is like modern-day Turkey and Syria. And these missionaries are so solid in the Word of God that they are on staff with guys like Barnabas and Saul and have such an impact in his life, like Saul's life. And literally, the Bible says in Antioch, they laid hands on Barnabas and Saul and sent them out. That's when Paul became the Apostle Paul. He was sent out by the disciples of Simon of Cyrene, who had literally carried the cross of Jesus. And I've mentioned a couple times that Simon had a family. And this brings us back to Rufus. The Bible says that Simon had two sons, Alexander and Rufus. So that means that day, this man, a family man, is snatched out of a crowd, and his whole family is given a front row seat to the greatest event in human history. And just a little boy, a kid, a kid at the cross named Rufus, it changes his life forever. Could you imagine being that kid? 
you've got the coolest dad on the face of the earth. Amen? Could you imagine being that kid? And how he probably had to tell that story over and over again? I could just imagine. If I was, if I was Rufus's friend, I'd be like, Rufus, tell me again. Tell me again what happened. And he said, man, we were just standing there. I mean, I had a hot dog, and, and I was watching our little lamb, and, and there was this crowd, and everybody was shouting. There was these soldiers and all these spears and swords, and there was this guy walking, and he goes through the whole story. And then my dad, my dad was just pulled into that, and he had to carry this cross. And guys, what we saw that day is a fulfillment of everything in our Bible. And he would have opened that Bible, we call it the Old Testament, and he would have pointed to everything in it and said, everything that this book is talking about, I got to see it fulfilled right before my eyes. You know what I would have said to Rufus? Tell it again. (laughs) One more time. Tell me that story. And ladies and gentlemen, For 2,000 years, we've been saying, tell it again, tell it again, tell it again, and it never gets old. A story that a kid at the cross went back to his hometown in Cyrene, And that story had such an impact that it spread across North Africa until they were sending missionaries to other continents. And some of those disciples even become the mentors and the pastors of a guy like the Apostle Paul. Until one day, as we read a moment ago, Paul writes his letter to the Romans. And he says, Great Rufus, whom the Lord picked out to be his very own. And also his dear mother, who's been a mother to me. You see, that gives me a lot of insight into this family. They were true believers. They were the kind of people that God used to change the world. I mean, if you think about it, what that statement about his mother says to me is that Paul's saying, I couldn't even be who I am if it wasn't for her. Because that's what I mean when I talk about my mom, amen? I can't even, I could not have done what I've done if it wasn't for Rufus and his mom and that wonderful family. So with all that said, I've got some takeaways for you, some lessons, lessons from a kid at the cross. Number one, this story reminds us that Jesus was in control of everything that happened and still is. He's walking down that road. He's carrying that cross. He's been beaten. He's been tortured. He's bleeding out. He's in pain. But now we know that he wasn't just walking slow because he was hurting. I believe he slowed down on purpose. Because he had a man in the crowd and a little boy in the crowd and a mother in the crowd. And he said, I've got to get them in on this story. I wonder, now that we know this, if we could have gone back, if there would have been some video of Jesus carrying that cross, if we could have maybe even seen his eyes looking, looking in the crowd, looking for Simon and Rufus and Alexander, looking for him. There they are, and he begins to slow down. He's like, oh, oh, it's getting so heavy. So those soldiers could reach over and grab these guys because that's who God wanted them to grab. Jesus was in control of everything. Nobody killed him. He gave his life for me and you. He never played a victim card. He's sovereign God. 
He's the God who created all things. He's the God who created the world, the universe. He's the God who created me and you. He is sovereign, holy God. And 2,000 years ago, when what happened to him happened to him, he was in absolute control, and he still is. And I don't know. He's got a lot to do and a lot going on. But I'm so thankful that one day he slowed down to snatch a young boy like me out of this world and get me in on his story. Aren't you glad he snatched you? Just plucked you? That's what my next takeaway is. Jesus will pluck you out of your comfort zone to do great things. He will pluck you out of your comfort zone to do great things. Now, when he plucked Simon, and he had to grab that cross, that bloody, terrible cross, when everybody's spitting at him and jeering at him, he probably was panicking a little bit, making sure his wife and kids were okay as he's getting pulled into this crowd. But now looking back, he... Simon would have realized, and so would have Rufus and his mother, that that was the greatest thing that could have ever happened to him. And it reminds us is that when God plucks us sometimes out of the crowd, when he plucks us, he grabs us, he changes our agenda, he changes our schedule, he, he pulls us into things that at the moment, or it's scary at the moment. It seems terrible at the moment. It seems, it seems everything's going wrong at the moment. We're wondering where God is. He's right there with us. That's where he is. He just pulled you up a little closer to him. The closer you get to Jesus, you might think it gets a little more peaceful and calm, but sometimes it gets a little more crazy, amen? I'm not trying to over-spiritualize this thing. I'm just saying there's a lesson there. Simon was pulled into the will of God, and at that moment, it, it seemed terrible. But it became a moment that changed their lives forever. And I'm telling you today, right now, that God may be doing something in your life that is giving your children a front row seat to the glory of God. They're getting to watch you go through something with Jesus Christ, and it may look hard, and it may look bad, it may look terrible, it may look scary, it may look like it's all wrong, but how you're doing it, the fact that you're walking with the Lord, and your children are watching, and your family's watching, and this world is watching, I'm here to tell you today, friend, be faithful to the Lord. Because he's plucking you out of this world to do great and mighty things. You're part of his story now. The other day I heard Elon Musk. As you know, he's made the news recently and, and uh, we're praying for him. Amen. It'd be great if that guy became a believer, wouldn't it? And I was listening to his story and he was saying how as he grew up as a kid and dealing with Asperger's and so forth that it caused him to just read, and, and he said, I took everything literally. Everybody else could understand all the unspoken things that people were saying. He said, but I just, everything about me was literal. And so he said, I was always in search of truth, universal, absolute truth. He said, I started reading theology, reading philosophy. He said, I was drawn uh, to physics because it was the rules of the universe, he said, that's why I've been all big into physics all my life. I wanted to know ultimate truth. I was listening to that, and I was like, oh, man, I wish he could read this book we read. Amen? I wish he could meet this Savior we know. I wish he could come to meet the one that kid at the cross got to see. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the source of all universal truth. That's my takeaway for you today. Rufus saw the one who defines life, the truth that defines all life. He answers all the questions that we have in this world. Jesus is the hope of the world, his truth. 
His truth. This morning we were chanting, He is risen. And the crowd was chanting back, He is risen indeed. Sometimes here at our church we say, God is good. All the time. See, we love this kind of stuff. But I was thinking that Jesus is the answer to everything. I was thinking, what if I said who? And if I said what? If I said how? When? Why? Because he is the answer. He's the answer. He's the only one who could be our Savior. Who? Jesus. The only one. Because he's the only one who is 100% God and 100% man. Think about that. No other religion in the world even tries to have somebody like that. They've counterfeited just about everything we believe, but nobody touches that. A divine human where God becomes a human and becomes a human for the purpose of salvation. You see, Jesus became you so that he could represent you before God. God demands of you obedience and holiness and righteousness, but you and I could not live up to that. So he became us so that he could live up to God's standards for us. That's his humanity. But not only that, he, he never ceased being divine, which is so important. Because on the cross in his divinity, he was able to absorb the entire wrath of God against our sin. See, the Bible teaches that because we're sinners, the wages of sin is death, and we owe God that because he created us. He created us for His glory, but we've lived for our own glory. So the Bible says that if we die in our sins, that we will spend eternity in a place called hell, and there we will pay for our sins for eternity. Some say, why eternity? And the reason why it's eternity is because we have sinned against an eternal God. So justice means that we have to pay an eternal price for our sin. So the Bible teaches that. Clearly, Jesus himself taught it. But here's what's so cool. Jesus being divine, when he died on the cross, the Bible says that he suffered the wrath of God for you and I. He even cried out, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And he knew the answer. God had forsaken him and judged him and condemned him because at that moment, he became our sin. He who knew no sin became our sin so that we could become God's righteousness. He wanted to make a swap. He said, I'll take their sin and give them my righteousness. I'll take their life their human life that is sinful and wicked and deserves hell, and I will give them my human life that has earned heaven. And in his divinity on that cross, he suffered the full payment for our sin. Remember, I said we owe God an eternal payment. So Jesus, because he was divine, never ceased being divine, He absorbed the eternal wrath of God. He was the only person with the nature, the eternal nature, to be able to pay in full for our sin. And that's what he did. That's the greatest truth ever been told on the face of the earth. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And I was thinking about Rufus. A little boy got to see all that. He got to see the gospel play out in person. And one other thing, one other thing. He got to see his dad carry the cross. And it reminds me of this verse in Luke 9, 23. When Jesus said to the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, 
take up your cross daily and follow me. And Rufus got to see his dad take up the cross. Isn't that weird? It's like a beautiful, perfect picture of what being a Christian is all about. It is coming up alongside Jesus. I'm not a Savior. He's the Savior. When he was on the cross, I was with him. I'm not him. I was with him. He was there for me. It was as if I was on the cross with him. Not being my own Savior, but being in him. So that when he died, I died in him. I was buried in him. I rose in him. Amen? And so now today, every day, I take up that cross. And I can call it my cross. The cross of Christ. I can take it up in my life and I can walk with my Lord and Savior. That's what being a Christian is all about. Again, nothing's by accident. God picked this family out on purpose so that you sitting here today can know the truth. One final thing, and I end with this. I think about the fact that Rufus and Simon and this family were from, well, they were from Africa right? And I got to thinking about it. When Jesus was born, where'd those wise men come from? It says wise men from the east, from Asia. Then you had Jesus being a Middle Easterner, growing up there in Israel. You had the Romans from Europe who came to be part of the crucifixion. Caucasians, and God, in His sovereignty, picked an African family and pulled them into this story so that we could get a beautiful picture that Jesus is God and Savior of the world. In God's sovereignty, isn't that beautiful? He had a way of pulling the whole world into the story. So that you here today, whomever you may be, whatever your background is, whatever your ethnicity, whatever your story is, I'm here to tell you today that Jesus knows your name. He knows your address. He knows everything about you. And he wants to pluck you right out of this world and make you his own. He wants you to join his story. The question is today, will you believe in Jesus Christ? Will you believe in him? You say, what do I need to believe? Just simply this. Believe that he's God and believe that he's Savior. That's what he wants. For you to believe that he's God, your God, and you will worship him and serve him as your God from this point on and have no other gods before him. Let him be the Lord and Savior of your life. If you will trust in him today, you can be part of this story. Let's bow our heads. As Christians all over this room and online are praying, we want to pray for you today who have never believed. You who are not yet followers of Christ. You who have not yet taken up this cross to follow Jesus. You may be seated right here this morning in this room or you may be watching online. And I'm telling you there are millions of Christians praying for people like you. Because we've been where you are. We've investigated this truth. We've thought about it. We've seen it. We've studied it. We've watched others who believe it. We've seen real Christians. We've seen hypocritical Christians. We've weighed all the options. Some of you have studied other religions and looked for help and hope in other ways. But in your heart today, between you and God and no one else, you know that Jesus is God. And he died on that cross and rose again. 
You've seen the evidence. How could you deny it? The people who were there, those who were eyewitnesses, saw it and believed. Every one of them saw it and believed. If today you believe, Right now in your heart, would you say, God, I no longer want to run from you. I no longer want to doubt you. I no longer want to be a skeptic. Today, I want to join your story. Dear God, I believe that Jesus is God. I believe that He's Savior. I want Him to be Lord of my life. God, I want to ask you to forgive me of my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. And God, I want you to come into my heart and forgive me of all of my sins and ask Him right now to give you credit for Jesus' life. And He'll do it. Just say, God, don't hold my sins against me. God, when you look at me, see Jesus. Hide me in Jesus. Let his life represent me from now on. That's what God wants to do. you got to be willing, friend. Open your heart to him right now. Ask Jesus to come in, and he will. Do you sense God speaking to your heart? Do you hear his voice? It's not an audible voice, it's the voice of His Spirit. You'll know it's God because when God speaks, He's calling you to Himself, to holiness. You say, well, maybe that's just me speaking to myself. No, friend, none of us in our nature wants this. We're rebels. We want to do this our own way. We're skeptics. We're so prideful. No, if you hear that voice in your heart and your spirit, that's God speaking to you. That's God speaking to you, friend. And I tell you, it is an awesome thing to hear from the Lord. And it's a terrible thing to reject Him. Like Simon that day and Rufus and his mother, God didn't. God could have plucked anybody out of that crowd. He plucked them. And you have the privilege this very day of hearing his voice as he plucks you out of this world. It'd be a terrible thing to reject him and say no. Think about that. It's the grace of God that has God speak to us. We don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. It's the grace of God that had Jesus come to this earth and become you for you, to die for you and live for you. And now he's speaking to your heart and giving you that chance, maybe your last chance, to give your life to Christ. Is there any good reason to say no to God? You may say, well, I've seen hypocrites before. Yeah, so what? That's not God. That's hypocrites. It's got nothing to do with you. Well, I've tried this before, and it didn't work. Oh, yeah? So it's not that big a deal, huh? You just quit. Man, we're talking about life and death in eternity. We're talking about who you were created to be. We're talking about the holiness and righteousness of God. Friend, what excuse could possibly be given to reject Him? 
He was willing to come to this earth and pay for your sin. Don't let anything come between you and God. Don't let anybody but come between you and God. He's calling you because he wants you. He wants you. You're the next Simon. You're the next Rufus. You're the next Simon's mother. He's calling you to follow him and do great things in his name. And whatever you've seen and whatever you've done, He's going to redeem that and use that for His glory. And nothing in your life has been wasted. And the mistakes and the pain and the scars can all be used in a miraculous way to become now the story of God's grace. If you will say yes to Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, I pray right now that you do your sovereign work reaching into the hearts of men and women, boys and girls, and calling us out, plucking us out of this world for your sake and your name and your glory. Hear our prayers, Lord. And on the basis of the finished work of Jesus Christ, we pray that you would have mercy on us and save us and gloriously use us to bring the greatest truth, the greatest message, the greatest news to this world, the answer that we've all been looking for. God, may we give our life to Jesus Christ. Lord, it's in his name we pray. Amen.